That is the question. Is if a decapitated chicken screams in the woods, would you hear it? Like, <laughs> I definitely think it makes that sound. I've already broken my rule that I wouldn't laugh, and I instantly laugh as soon as we open on a really horrific story today. This was not funny at all. And it, I, what is the name originally? <laughs> and welcome back to the Codex Cantina. If you've been here before, if this is your first time, we take a conversational approach to stories and literature. If you're down for that type of a mission, hit that subscribe button to join us. And hello, I'm Chicken Crypto, and welcome to the Codex Cantina. We always start off with publication information. The Capitated Chicken was published in July 1909 in Caras y Caratas, and our version was translated by Margaret Sayers Pendant, and we'll leave a link down in the description where you can read for free. And as always, disclaimer, we try our best with pronunciations, but we're, we're terrible, but we're trying to get better at it, so please they know bear I'm with terrible. us. <laughs> if you've well, been around the, here you know how terrible i am the new people need to learn that right so. <laughs> okay no offense about my terribleness i apologize but i try so in the forward to this i have this quote about kiroga where it says kiroga's world is one ruled by tragedy the decapitated chicken which anticipates some of william faulkner's obsessions and themes is perhaps kiroga's most representative story which got me excited because william faulkner is one of my favorite authors I mentioned it to Jack, who also covered the story. We'll leave a link to his channel down below. And he said, well, I don't know if it's his most representative, but it is truly one of his most horrific for a man that led a life of tragedy with his father accidentally getting killed <laughs> with, uh, with, a, with his own gun. Uh, his father-in-law committed suicide. One of his own friends was preparing for a duel where Kiroga accidentally sh fired the gun off, killing his friend. Uh, his wife committed suicide, and then years after this story, he also committed suicide. So a man enveloped in tragedy comes at us with a very tragic story today. I guess when your life is enveloped by death, you're going to write about death. And what I found fascinating that there is death in this story when we get to the spoiler section of it, but the graphic nature of violence on children that I think should be a big trigger warning is something that was unexpected, especially when it comes so abruptly at the end of the story. So there's your warning. Let's jump into our plot, and then we'll do our discussion and analysis. So we open on a couple, man and wife, Mazzini and Berta. They are in love and wish for their child to have grace, manners, and intelligence, and they give birth to their first son. Twelve months in, however, convulsions kick in and cause the child to become expressionless and unreactive. The child would sit around with a dull look, and drool. Mazzini asks the doctor, is it hereditary? The doctor says that he should look into his lungs wife. She's dying of consumption. They have a second kid, convulsions again at 18 months in. The couple felt that their love was cursed, but continued anyways. Next, twins. Same thing with the convulsions, and then the, child's, the children become brain dead after that. So they bicker, they blame each other, they continue to raise their four boys, and eventually they make up and decide to try one more time. And they kind of give up on the, we want our children to be perfect and intelligent. We just want a healthy but child. It's kind of what they, they? It's kind of, well, that's what they say. Yeah. Okay, I should say that. Not in their so hearts, now they have, but they say. So now they have a daughter, Bertita. And the child has no issues and all of their contentment is poured into her. Meanwhile, their four boys are ignored even more and neglected even in basic needs such as hygiene. One day, when Bartita is four, she eats too many sweets and becomes sick. The parents begin to worry and blame each other, and the mother snaps that with his grandfather like that, they must not be surprised, and he blames her lung as they start to bicker over the blame of their problems. Staying up late, worrying, the wife starts to cough blood the next morning. They realize they need a break. So they head out and order a servant to kill a hen while they're out. And while the servant is wringing the bird's neck and plucking its feathers, the servant is shocked when she turns and finds the four boys staring at her. The couple head out for a while, and when we return, the four boys sit on the bench staring blankly at the wall once again. Bertita decides that she wants to look out over the ledge. She grabs a chair to look over the ledge and suddenly feels a tug. She turns to find her four brothers have stood up and are now pulling and pu tugging at her. She yells out in terror, but is silenced when one of the boys grabs her by the neck and snaps it. She's dragged by her leg, lifeless, to the kitchen. 
like the chicken had been that morning. Yeah, Sorry, getting pretty goosebumps. Rough. Yeah. Oof. The thought. Well, and, and then there's even that line about how they part they take her hair like feathers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a, this is Oof. an intense story. The yeah, father calls out for his daughter and hears no response. He enters the kitchen and discovers the blood on the floor. The wife comes running and the husband stops her from witnessing the horror. End plot. So there you go. Aren't you glad we chose this for Halloween? <laughs> this, this definitely fits in with uh, the Halloween horror stories, man. Wow. <laughs> wow. No boogeymen here except maybe the parents. So it's worth saying we're going to go dive into this, but you know we're going to look at this as a piece of fiction. Everything is horrific. Everything is terrible, but we're not looking at this as real people. We're looking at it as, um, what does this say about us? H- how do we interpret these actions in a sense? So let's start with just the title. Why on earth is this called The Decapitated Chicken, Mr. Crypto? I think it has a lot to do with that. Sometimes we emulate the things that we see in nature and that like the literal killing of the chicken happens to the child as well. And I think that here, even after death, life continues on for whatever experience you may make of it. Well, let's say this. The boys, do they see compassion from their parents? No, sir. Not to them, at least. Maybe to Pratita, but they don't see that. What they see is the violence, the wringing of the neck. And it's worth noting that in terms of the choice of words, the but first of all, the parents start saying it and your children to you know associate blame. But they also use a lot of bestial words to describe the children. The, the narrator is specifically calling out that the children are viewed as lesser than, again, fictional characters. We're not talking about anyone actually like this. That they're viewed as lesser than, that they're animalistic. And when a chicken gets its head cut off, right? Have you ever, have you ever seen it first? You grew up in the country. You've seen it, right? Yeah, I have actually seen it. It's, it's very startling to see an animal running around with a head, with, without a head, because you think, wait a minute, like our brains are in our head. That controls everything, right? But in this instance, it, the, the chicken will run around for possibly several minutes before it will, uh, you know, realize that it is technically dead. I mean, it'll run, it'll flap its wing. It's a nervous response, like a, a, like a, a physical thing happening uh, with, with, with no brain. And you can do that with uh, octopus too, right? Like if you ever put salt on an octopus, it'll start to kind of squirm and stuff. But the idea is it's like this automatic That's response. Horrific. <laughs> it is. Well, good. That, that's the feeling you the should have of this reading is just the story. so terrible. <laughs> oh, Lord. So to me, um, I kind of looked at these children like that too. Not necessarily like once they're brain dead, are they like that? That's not how I took that. I took that of when their love from their parents was being deprived of them, that they no longer were functioning. That's when they became this this automatic response and when they saw the the chaos and murder of the, you know the chicken having its fin- you know feathers plucked and its its neck wrung that's when they started to emulate that when the parents stopped showing compassion to them so to me the decapitated chicken you know that running around automatic response is kind of how I viewed these boys after the parents cut off their love for them is when they started to kind of have these types of responses and I, I guess I'm kind of curious what what that what does that mean I don't know I, does it mean they're that we are products of nature, or is it nurture? Is it the the sins of the father here are being passed on, or retribution? I I almost argue the idea that that it's just a reactionary thing. I think that we aren't giving enough credit to the boys that they are as brain dead or as awful off as the parents portray them in the story i think the boys understand compassion and love and they're seeing that being bestowed upon their sister and they specifically see what happens to this chicken they obviously know how death works and they go to their parents prized child and reenact this horrific event on them I think that I think this is retribution to the parents. I don't think it's just happenstance of them emulating something they saw and saying, "Hey, we saw this done this. Why don't we do it to our sister?" I I think that there's a lot more there that this is very intentionally sending a message to mom and dad saying, "Hey, we're better than what you think we are." What greater happiness for two people in love than the blessed consecration of an affection liberated from the vile egotism of purposeless love and what is worse for love itself, love without any possible help of renewal? 
I think that speaks to what you're talking about right there. Like the, the boys from the boys perspective, they're, they're lacking that renewal of love. And, you know, it's horrific to think about because I, I don't know how much consciousness was put behind their actions. Was it just an automatic response from them? I don't know. But the end result is to your point, they are taking away the only joy, which is horrific too, because it's like, well, why is, you know, you've got five kids. Why is joy only coming from one of them? And why is it as soon as joy is possible, all of a sudden blame, the blame game comes out, right? They start blaming them for the four other ones. So the four other ones stature became even lower when Bertita came, uh, came about, that they started blaming and actually saying that this is worse because now we know we can succeed. And that's even maybe more horrific than the ending too, to think about how the parents treated these children. You know, what's even more horrific is how I sometimes feel about myself after reading a story like this. As you were going through this, and then this horrific things happens to this child, and I was mad at the parents, but then I'm like, did they deserve that? Well, maybe they deserve something terrible to happen to them, but this innocent child didn't deserve to die. And then, like, I'm I'm angry at myself, and there's so much blame to go around here. Oh, man, this this story, it hits you in the feels. It really does. Well, and there's, the way I looked at it, there's this one quote, until this time, each had taken his own share of responsibility for the misery their children caused. But hopelessness for the redemption of the four animals born to them finally created that imperious necessity to blame others that is the specific patrimony of inferior hearts. One br brilliant writing from Kidoka. Like, well, let's, while we keep talking about horrific, we should also talk about how uh, crafted the, the lyricism is of the story. But also, when I take a look at this, it makes me think, you know, as we talk about blame, I hear you drop the, the blame word there, is, is how automatic are our responses when we get upset, particularly with our wives sometimes? I don't want to speak for you, but sometimes <laughs> when I get mad, you know, to your same point of how you felt after reading the story, there's times after I get mad where I'm like, I didn't really want to say that. I don't really feel that way. Here's why I think I was upset, and I think I just wanted to lash out i wanted to you know it sounds terrible but hurt the other person because sometimes we think that's going to make us feel better when we can when we feel bad is to bring other people down and that's what's so terrible about how what these parents were doing and these children is that they're trying to hurt and bring down the other person because almost like you don't want to see other people not hurting if you're hurting it's it's very complex the way we get and the more angry we get the more automatic that is, where all of a sudden you're saying things and the next day you're like, why did I say that? That was so stupid. I know for me personally that the most angry I get is when I feel like I know that my wife is right and I'm in the wrong. I retaliate and lash out and I blame because I can't take responsibility for what I know has occurred or happened. And I think that both of these parents are doing that because they don't want it to be themselves. If they can put the blame on someone else, if it can be your fault our children are like this, then I can feel better about myself. Which is really sad, too, that, and maybe this is a, because of the time period of the piece, that why wouldn't you just love your child? Because to me, I think about it, and I don't have children, mind you, that if alive is okay with me. Well, to, to me, we're both landing on this coming back to parental discussions i've noticed we're not focusing on the children and it's quotes like this where they say so it was their blood their love that was cursed and it makes me think about these moments of what does it mean to have cursed love and what does it mean that they poison their own well in a sense with this one it's it's a horrific story and i knew it was going to be that's why we chose it for this you know halloween season but it also is very good at if you can step away from just literally interpreting what's happening and you look at what drives us to become animalistic whether it's by choice by nature what are the things that we are in control of what are the things that we know we need to be better at and i think that's when literature is its strongest and i think that's probably one of the things about the story is some people read the story and it'll be a couple of days that it, it's still in the back of their head like they're still thinking about it. And there's something to be said about that, about how literature can be that door 
that can open up opportunities for changes in your in you as a person. All right, so let's wrap it up there and let's move into our subjective ratings. Uh, we'll leave a playlist down. Blah, 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 blah. All right, so let's wrap it up there. We'll move into our subjective ratings. We'll leave a playlist down below for more Kyorga related chats and uh, leave us a comment or emoji. Mr. Uno, what are you going to give this one? This is one where I don't know if I can rate because the number doesn't encapsulate the horror. A number doesn't encapsulate the way it makes me reflect. This isn't a story where I'm like reaching forward to read again. It is a story that will reach out to me in my memories and I'll think about. And I don't know if a number really does a good job of encapsulating that. So my final words are, I think this is truly horrific. If you've listened to this because you're not too worried about spoilers and you just kind of want to hear us talk or you have read it. I think, I think you just know that this is, you know whether this is going to be for you or not. It's powerful emotionally, and some people can handle that. And for some people, they need to steer clear of some of the warnings. So that's my final thoughts. I agree. I can't give this one a number. I think this is a story that is going to be either for you or not for you. Uh, it's not a true horror story, but we've used that term, that adjective a lot tonight, that it is something that is very graphic. And I don't know if you're going to enjoy this one way or the other, but it is beautifully written. It is a story that maybe help you uh, understand nature versus nurture. And for me, I just, I get angry at those parents of why, why does love have to have a limitation? And that's, I guess, a lesson learned here is I don't want to be a person like that. So that can be maybe the one simple positive takeaway for me is <laughs> hopefully this will make me a better person that I can love unconditionally. Well, all right, guys, I hope you enjoyed the conversation and perhaps looking at it in a different light. Uh, we post videos every Monday and Thursday. Hit that subscribe button to join us on the journey. Una out. Peace.